Victoria Rolson, Benedict Evans, Tim Cohen, thank you very much for your availability and agreeing to discuss a very vibrant topic within the Digital Market Research Hub. The topic of today's conversation is uh, the, the application of the Digital Markets Act uh, to the App Store provisions. We know that very recently the, the Commission hosted uh, another stake, stakeholder workshop focused specifically on this issue, and there were quite a few very interesting appealing matters which would probably uh, help for, to, the, to our cluster to learn more. And we have this opportunity to discuss it with people who know the, the mechanics of the process very, very deeply. They have different views, which is another benefit for, for us. So without further ado, I would propose we start with this team just highlighting or reminding all of us the, the necessity for, for the reform, what are the main driving forces, potential advantages, and what do we want to achieve this? Yeah, I'll confine myself to three points at the beginning, I think. Um, thanks very much, Alice. The, the, I mean, the, the basic point about why we need a new regulation is because the, the existing antitrust law is bedeviled because it, it works very slowly, or the customs and practices that have been adopted over many years are slow. Um, so the idea is that you get a faster um, application of the law in these particular settings. I think the other thing, which I was at a commission um, commission organised meeting about why they needed the DMU some time ago, and John John Tyrrell um, stood up, and he he's written a book about it. He's quite famous in economic circles, and um, his book's called Economics for the Common Good. And he said, look, if you've got a telecoms network, it's got a high externality, meaning that there's an additional benefit for every user to be joined to the existing bigger user base. That's true of all sorts of messaging platforms from Facebook Messenger to Google's you know, email networks to the, the, the economics that you get in terms of running um, searches. So if you've got one of these platforms, um, replicating it isn't going to happen. And we know if you look at the history of some of the antitrust cases, that if you're spending over a billion a month on um, upgrading your search facility and Microsoft gives up because it's too much money to spend, which is what happened in Microsoft, Yahoo and, and, the, and the Google competition for search, then you're very unlikely to have a competing alternative to the platform. Um, so there's a need to regulate the platform in the public interest because it's a monopoly that's going to be unassailable. That's the basic premise for having the regulation in the first place. Um, and that, if you look over time, is applied to utilities, it's applied to water, gas, electricity, energy, you know, in both on both sides of the Atlantic, we've got a long tradition of regulating these things. Um, I think the other thing, that's my, my final point on, on, you know, why it's why it's needed now is something that's sometimes overlooked, which is that we don't buy our electricity or our gas or our water or our telecoms or anything else these days, except from using one of these, whether it's an Android handset or an Apple handset. That's, you know, the majority of, uh, of users worldwide are using one form of operating system or browser or the other um, and that control over information affects the prices of everything it affects the information that is available for product innovation process innovation for everything that's bought by consumers and that's fundamental to an entire market economy so you know you have to have information for product development for process improvement um, to be, make a better mousetrap. And at the moment, that's being controlled by the major uh, platforms for their own interests because they keep it and they don't pass it on. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, Victoria, if I, if I can revert to you, 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 you were chairing one of the panels within, within this workshop. So if you could probably summarize the main thesis which you have uh, put forward and maybe we can talk about your impressions and outcomes in the course of the conversation. Sure, so what I thought I'd do is just share um, what I talked about on Monday at the DMA stakeholder workshop um, to give you an idea of what we were talking about. There were three panels. Um, my panel that was the first panel 
um, on giving choice to app developers and end users. So articles 5, 4, 5, 5, and 5, 7 of the DMA. Then there was another panel um, which was focusing on article 6, 4 of the DMA. So uh, installing, so site loading and installing other um, app stores as well. And the third panel, uh, so the second panel uh, was Jan Krema as the academic presenting, and otherwise it was just um, people with, yeah, from the from the industry. And the third panel was on brand access, so Article Six Twelve of the DMA, where Rupert Potsun was was presenting as an academic, and then followed by by all those um, industry um, people. So. I can just speak for my panel, obviously, but I, I listened in on a debate on the others as well. So what we were talking about was really how to how the DMA might give more choice both to app developers and um, to uh, app users. So all of us, basically. And uh, I started off by just going back to the DNA of the DMA, so to speak. Uh, where you do see that choice is one of the uh, one of the outcomes that the DMA wants to see, because what it wants to ensure is contestable and fair markets, which also means um, broadening choice. And of course, uh, platform envelopment that we currently see happening is reducing that choice. So hopefully the DMA might be able to break open some of those gates um, that the gatekeepers are guarding very closely. Um, and so the app store provisions that I was talking about might be able to do that. Now the app, app stores are found quite frequently in the DMA. There's 28 mentions of app stores or software application stores as they're called, three mentions of in-app payment systems. So there's plenty there and there's plenty more provisions that actually um, also concern app stores, but don't name them as such. So we know that the DMA applies to app stores um, and actually wants to um, regulate them quite closely. Um, if you look at the DMA system, of course, it, the DMA only applies if there's a gatekeeper, which means a company that provides a core platform service and it has to be, the gatekeeper has to be designated and that's the process will start happening uh, we'll see start happening now very soon. Um, in terms of, is there a core platform service in app stores? The answer is yes, because the core platform services also include online intermediation services. And um, article two actually explicitly says that software application stores are a type of online intermediation service, um, which is focused on software applications as the intermediated product or service. Um, and in terms of who might be such um, uh, an app store that could be a gatekeeper, obviously there's there's two um, in, in mobile smart operating systems. So the ones you see on the slide, the Apple App Store for the iOS ecosystem and um, the Google Play Store for the Android ecosystem. Now, what are the provisions that we discussed in quite some depth? That's Article 5.4 to start with which is an obligation that relates to the app store's behavior towards its app developers and how these app developers can then approach their end users. And so I've changed the provision slightly so you only see um, them apply to app stores, but they provide to gate, uh, they apply to gatekeepers more generally. Um, but here we're talking about app stores. So the pink is what I've changed. Um, what app developers have to be allowed to do is contact end users and promote offers to them. And what's important is that those offers can contain different conditions that are available through the app store, like a different price, different cancellation policy, different subscription models, and so on. And importantly, also the app store can't charge its app developers for this. So here really the DMA is trying to reduce how app developers rely and are dependent on gatekeeper app stores. So to really ensure that users are able to multi-home and also the app developers are able to multi-home. And so this is sort of, you know, an anti-anti-steering provision because currently what we see in the conditions, terms and conditions of app stores is anti-steering provisions. App developers are not allowed to steer users away from the app store. So this article 5.4 is this anti-anti 
capacity steering provision to break, break up the closed app store ecosystem that we can see. And this was initially um, 5.4 and 5.5 were initially one provision. Um, we'll see Article 5.5 in a minute. And so this was then separated into giving choice to app developers, 5.4, and giving choice to end users also of app stores um, in 5.5. And in addition to that, this under different conditions was also added later on. And I think that's that's a very powerful, um, powerful part of the provision. So moving on to Article 5.5, the second provision we discussed, um, that's an obligation that relates to how the App Store behaves towards end users and how these end users may then in turn access their apps. So in a way, it's a necessary corollary to the obligation that we just saw in Article 5.4 but also to the gatekeeper obligation in 5.3, which is a more general one. But again, 5.5 is with a specific focus on the end user side of things. And also uh, Buke was, uh, so Vanessa Turner from Buke, the consumer organization was speaking um, at the stakeholder workshop as well, because of course, end users should have a benefit from the DNA. And so what Article 5.5 says is that end users can access and use their apps through the app store with all functionalities. It does not matter how they acquire the app, either through the app store or outside of it. Um, so this, this emphasis on user choice, I think, is important because a lot of the discussions about the DMA are really about prohibitions for the gatekeeper. Well, actually, here we see there's also this other emphasis on choice for business users and also choice for end users. Um, so to, the example that I gave was um, if I buy an ebook outside of the app store, then I want to and will be able to access that ebook through my ebook reader app, even if I obtained the ebook reader app through the app store. Now, it doesn't say free of charge like Article 5.4 does, but um, in the light of Recital 41, anything but free access would probably undermine or restrict end users' ability to access their content. Um, what might be tricky when implementing this is that it says, App Store providers shall allow. Um, so that means within existing technical means. It's questionable uh, what kind of means are necessary and would have to be developed to actually enable this. So this will certainly be a point of contention. Um, now, finally, another provision we discussed is Article 5.7. There we go. Um, and that's a different kind of provision. It's an obligation on the App Store provider not to require its own identification service, um, web browser, payment service, or technical services that support the provision of payment services when end users um, use an app or when app developers use, offer, or interoperate with an app. And that is, of course, a really important provision because right now those, well, what I call ancillary services, um, are often provided tied to the actual app store. Um, so the intention of the provision is really to ease the effects of platform envelopment and keep markets open, contestable, also hopefully promote innovation and related services, um, because what the CMA found in its mobile ecosystem study is that those that innovation in related services would stall if this tying behavior were to continue. So that I think is a very powerful prohibition and it was also, if you look at the original DMA proposal, this provision has grown and was increased. So now three services are covered um, rather than the, the one that uh, the original proposal had foreseen. And in addition, um, there can be, um, those ancillary services can be added to through a commission delegated act um, and that based on a market investigation. So that might also be interesting for the future um, when those services develop further. So that was um, the provisions that we talked about at the DMA stakeholder workshop on Monday. And yeah, quite Thank some you. interesting discussions on this as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Ricky. Uh, um, Benedict, if I may ask you to highlight your reflection on, on the DMA more generally and uh, this provision specifically, this set of provisions. Yeah, so I mean, I, I really think it, it's kind of useful that, that, that Timothy kind of pointed out both the speed of regulation challenge, which is, it's really kind of a systemic challenge to regulation of technology, because if you're kind of regulating a supermarket or an airline, uh, the entire nature and structure of the industry 
doesn't change every five or 10 years, whereas in technology it does. I mean, we sort of, we saw this in particular with I think the online shopping um, case in the EU where the EU um, was um, dealing with a complaint about something that had happened 10 years earlier, by which time most of the people involved had kind of died, um, like it was become kind of irrelevant. Um, and I'd absolutely agree also with his point about natural monopolies, um, which I think was a, a, not the phrase that he used, but kind of the way that I would understand the point that there are there are kinds of market and kind of industry where you can't just kind of break something up um, and where one particular business has, a, in effect, um, sufficient barriers to entry that are sort of inherent in the product that, you, you know, it's very difficult for, for new competitors to enter. And you see that in everything from kind of PC productivity suites to um, smartphone operating systems. And so I would absolutely agree that, you know, conduct regulation of some kind is the answer if you identify some sort of a problem. Um, I very often, however, compare regulating technology to regulating cars in that, you know, we do regulate cars, except that actually, if you unpack that a second, no, we regulate 15 or 20 different things. And so um, our conversations about what we do about teenage boys getting drunk and driving too fast are kind of unrelated from whether we should pedestrianize Amsterdam, which is also unrelated to um, how we think about the safety of the construction of cars. And then when you dig into each of those questions, you tend to find that they're actually quite complicated and they're full of trade-offs. And that if you ask for X, you're probably going to lose Y. Um, a particular thing that that I think is is relevant to this conversation, which is a point that I heard at a um, the last in-person competition conference I went to before the pandemic, which was sort of two weeks before the pandemic, which was maybe it was a super spreader event amongst competition experts, um, in which sort of somebody kind of made the point that you know, you know, Facebook. Um, goes to the competition regulator and the competition regulator says um, you have to make it easy to get user data out and they go across the street to the privacy regulator and says well and the privacy regulator says you have to make it harder to get user data out and Adam Masseri says well I'm an engineer I can do either but you're kind of going to need to choose which and I think you see that issue that sort of tension between privacy and competition particularly strongly um, in the app store um, and I think one should sort of sort of step back there and say, well, the app store is kind of one part of a system. So there is the app store itself, which you could separate into um, um, the installation mechanism and the payment mechanism, and then the rules about what can be in the store. And then there is also the sandbox on the device. So you know you can sideload, you know, you could, for the sake of argument, um, sideload an application onto a device, but it would still not have access to certain functions because the platform owner has decided that third-party apps can't do that. Um, and so in a sort of com competition situation, um, you kind of need to consider that sort of entire environment. Um, you know, you can oblige Apple to allow a third party SMS app into the store, but a third party app can't access SMS when it's on the device. So it kind of doesn't make any difference. Um, and so actually one kind of needs to consider that complete system. Um, and then when one looks at those decisions, um, I think there's a sort of a three-way thing here, as I, having said, you know, competition versus privacy, there is sort of competition, privacy, and product. Um, so, for example, one could propose an app that I could install on my son's phone that would watch everything that he did, apply machine learning analysis to it, and then flag me if there was something problematic happening. Um, you can't do that on the iPhone because Apple has decided that apps cannot run in the background and cannot see everything that's being done. And they've done that for kind of two reasons. Firstly, um, privacy and user security. Secondly, battery life. And a company that wanted to do this could turn around and say, well, the user should have the choice to press a button that says, OK, I'm going to allow an app to do this. And Apple would reply, you can't give con informed consent to some of these kinds of questions. You can't give informed consent to allow an app to run in the background and access everything that you might want to do, not when you're dealing with a billion or two billion or three billion users and the kind of adversarial environment um, that we face. Um, because, of course, um, when you come at this from a competition perspective, you can say, well, Apple isn't letting this or Google isn't letting this competitor to do this. And Apple and Google would say, you're entirely right, but we're also not letting 500 scam apps and 500 hackers and the Chinese intelligence agency not do that. And we kind of have to make a decision over the platform as to whether X or Y capability is going to be possible per se. And our decision for that 
may be around privacy and security. It may be around protecting device functionality. For example, no, you don't want to get to a situation where the app has 45 different apps all running in the background, all claiming that they have a good reason to do that and giving your phone a five-minute battery life. But then, of course, that may also be a purely competitive question. And generally, it's kind of some kind of some combination of all of those. So um, Google complains that Apple does not allow Google to have a messaging app um, that replaces the SMS functionality on the phone. And Meta complains the same thing. Apple would say, yes, um, that's both a privacy and security question, but it's also our platform, and we don't want to let a competitor do that. Um, the the in-app payment issue, I think, in here is, is kind of particularly fascinating um, because, again, you can kind of see all of those components. You know, Apple very explicitly see the 30 percent as their sort of fee for providing the store for free to everybody else. They think, yes, we're charging you rent for this and we've got a right to charge you rent for that. And so one could have a conversation about that. But they would also say, you know, when I give my 10 year old his, an, app, an iPhone, I know he can install an app. I know that app can't run in the background and steal data. And I also know that when that app asks for money to buy a level, it doesn't ask me to plug a credit card in. It goes through this completely safe and secure and trusted payment system. And I don't have to worry anytime I buy something in an app, I know it's safe and secure and trusted. And if we're, as we now move to a situation in which um, any app can ask for a credit card, is that a good thing? Well, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. It will lead to an increase in credit card fraud. Uh, it will also unlock business models and opportunities, um, in particular for companies like Spotify, where I think the kind of the, the case for, for intervention is actually completely unarguable, and I think there's no question um, that Spotify should win its case there. Um, but, you know, this random app game, cool game that my son wants to play from this random developer from a country on the other side of the world that's asking for a credit card. Well, today it can't ask for a credit card, so I don't have that. That's a, and that's that's kind of good. If it can ask for a credit card, that becomes kind of a question. Um, ironically, of course, this is actually, you know, allowing people to ask for credit cards is actually much better for, better for big developers than small developers. If you've got a giant brand, then you can safely ask for a credit card and customers will trust you um, and you'll get that extra margin. If you're a small brand, if nobody's ever heard of you, then customers probably won't and you'll probably carry on using in-app purchase just because it, it, it kind of has that trust, um, that trust aspect to it. So there's all sorts of, I would say, sort of um, trade-offs and compromises in the implementation of this. And one cannot simply look at it and say, well, you do this and that has a competition benefit. And if Apple or Google aren't letting you do that, that's bad for competition. It may well be. It may also be good for the user. It may indeed also be good for the ecosystem and for developers, or it may be good for some developers at the cost of other developers. It may be a classic a tragedy of the commons problem in which any given developer would like to be able to do that. But if you let all developers do that, then your battery life collapses and your phone heats up and you get an enormous data bill. And anybody sort of sitting and running platform at Apple or Google is kind of trying to balance these. And one of the balances is we make lots of money from that. And why are we letting our competitor do this? But there are other considerations in there as well, um, just as there would be if you were regulating a car or regulating a bank. Some of those decisions are self, some of those trade offs are self seeking, some of them aren't. And you know, to sort of wrap up, my concern sometimes is that. You know, we grew up with cars and we understand how they work. We don't necessarily, we didn't grow up with software and we don't necessarily know how, we, how it worked. Um, my favorite kind of example here is another part of the DMA, which said that um, all messaging apps had to allow any third party app to interconnect um, and give them complete access to all internal data. And so the product manager of WhatsApp says, number one, I have 500 spammers trying to access my systems every day. You just told me I have to let them in and let them send spam to all of my users. And number two, I have the Chinese government trying to get into my system every day. And you've just told me that I have to let the Chinese government get in and give it complete access to, quote, unquote, all of my data, unquote. Is that what you meant to say? And the EU kind of goes quiet. And then a couple of weeks later, there's a 40 page document that says, oh, no, actually, we didn't mean that. And those kinds of trade offs, I think, are kind of important. Because as I sort of said earlier, you can there is a, there are competition questions here, but those are not the only reasons why these product decisions get taken or the only criteria that apply. Thank you very much, Benedict. 
uh, Tim, if I, if I may revert to you and ask your opinion, do you think that uh, the DMA is well well calibrated to to deal with this uh, with at least some or many or all of these uh, shortcomings, perhaps uh, mentioned by by Benedict, or is, is any law is as as perfect to 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 comprehend and capture and provide all potential answers to all potential and real uh, problems and, and and challenges. What what is your view on, on this specific provision? One of the things that, that Ben was talking about, which is a live issue, is the Spotify case. And you know, as I understand it, Spotify's problem is that Spotify doesn't know who's using its service because Google runs the billing system or Apple runs the billing system. So they've got a bundled billing system that they're obliged to use. They can't use any third party. So what the idea of this is, I think in principle, is that that would be unbundled. The Spotify would then be able to use and choose an alternative um, payment system. But I'm intrigued to your question, Oles, will it work? Um, well, it says the App Store provider, just say Apple and Google, shall not require end users to use, offer, or interoperate with, blah, blah. Okay, they can't require it, but does that mean um, that they're going to do more on the thing that needs to be done? You know, can they just argue that the, ter the term, that the words require uh, are such that, you know, that ends up in litigation for ages? Because what Spotify wants to do doesn't fall within the definition of that word. I mean, it seems to me that there's an issue there. I know there's a separate case running about that, but I think the, the underlying principle is that those that are running apps in app stores shouldn't be tied into the, um, the, the, the obligation to use a particular payment service. So it's a different thing than enabling some other service to interoperate with the rest of the system. Well, so there's a neat point. That... I was going to say there's a neat point in here, which is that um, Apple and Google are charging variously either 30 or 50, 15% processing. Mm -hmm. And as you may know, kind of credit card processing fees are more like sort of between one and a half and 3%. And, and so they're still it, regarded as monopolistic and regulated. Yeah, exactly. Well, in the EU, not in the US, in the US not. Um, but in the um in those places, sort of, there have been a couple of places where Apple has, and Google have already been required to unbundle this. And what they've done is they said, OK, we're going to create an API that lets you use your third party payment processor and you pay us 27 percent commission on that. Which is probably breaking the spirit of the law, but, 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 but not the letter. Um, and of course, Apple, as I sort of alluded to when I was talking earlier, Apple regards this as like the, the rent for running the store. Like lots of people, like Uber doesn't pay a penny, a Amazon doesn't pay a penny, but if you're making money through our store, you have to pay us 30%. And because the regulators have kind of come at this by looking at payment processing, rather than thinking about it as a commission on the revenue, Apple has turned around and said, okay, you can use your own payment processor, just carrying on paying us, you pay us 27% now. Um, I mean, do you do you think it's? I mean, that that is interesting, but I, I'm not sure it's the right starting point because talking about commission on revenue and that this is a store is framing the issue hmm. in a way which I would I would question. So, I mean, what what you've got is if you've got a store, is you do have a physical property and there is rent to be paid. But what's happening with a platform? Let's say you're you're accessing Spotify, which is an attractive music. Um, curated system or a newspaper which you access three or four times a day the thing that is attracting the user to using the platform is the content right so what you're what you're actually not doing is is properly attributing the value of the content to the person who's providing it in this in Spotify's case they're kind of questionably profitable songwriters get paid very little as we know um, in newspapers, I've seen some of your slides, Benedict, which I think show the, uh, you know, the, the the collapse of newspaper incomes in journalism because that's being eaten not by not by software quite so much as by online advertising and online advertising's ability to target advertising and then you know obviously 
to, to get a, a, a bigger return than newspapers get, which is at the expense of the newspapers. So I, what, what I'm kind of pushing at is the idea that there should be a rental paid. When the, the thing that um, seems to me to be pretty obvious actually is there's a huge amount of, of value that's generated by the content provider that isn't being paid because you've got a monopoly access system because everybody's got one of these things in the pocket and there are only two browser owners yeah. i have to put my hand up and, and declare an interest i've just done a, a complaint for the movement for an open web uh yeah. about the way that standards are being gerrymandered by google and apple at the w3c and how they've managed that in particular in relation to payment systems over the last five years so I think this whole issue of payments is very fraught but i think the the fundamental point that I, i'm pushing back on is value um is something that needs to be paid to a distributor i think that's wrong yeah so i wouldn't i mean i i i mention apple's position not not as an endorsement but as simply as okay an fair enough you know um, apple apple's position very publicly has been look we built the store we run the store we make all these apis we build all this stuff to make it easier for developers to build on our platform and we give it away for free and they have a cost base associated with making all of the apis and all the platforms and all the tools it's not you know yes they're not running a store but that doesn't mean that there isn't an enormous cost base for them for producing the capability to put apps onto this device. And if they just got rid of all of that and said, well, there's just a web browser, they've saved a lot of money and they spend a lot of money to let people buy apps. And so they've chosen, for example, instead of saying, if you want to put an app into our store, you have to pay us a thousand dollars, Amazon pays them zero, Uber pays them zero. They've chosen to monetize in that way. Now, I think one can perfectly well argue, well, they shouldn't be, but that's that's their position. Um, we, we agree with yeah. it or not, but that's what gets them to this idea that, well, if you are using an alternative credit card provider, you still have to pay us 27%. I think the, um, the, the kind of egregious issue with um, Spotify and also with eBooks is actually a quote from 2008 or nine when Apple was tightening up the rules to say you have to use their system, which again is fascinating. We weren't having this conversation. This is the conversation. This is basically arguments from 10 years ago. Um, as Steve Jobs said, and this is more or less a direct quote, but I'm quoting from memory, um, that we need to be upfront that you have to use our payment system and we recognize this will make some business models impossible right? because Spotify's contract structure at the time was they had to pay a fixed percentage of their top line to record companies they didn't have 30 percent and that's actually why Spotify isn't using in-app payment because they don't have the 30 percent to give to, to the to, to give to Apple the same thing for ebooks um book publishers don't have 30 percent to give to Apple so they couldn't use the in-app payment and give Apple a 30 percent commission because they've got like a five percent margin and they would be giving <laughs> Apple 30 percent um and I think that in particular is why the the Apple the the Spotify case became so absurd because there, there was no possible argument that this was in anybody's interest except Apple it was purely self-serving and Apple were kind of honest that that was that was the, the rationale I think Vicky, uh, coming up to... I would make is I would I would kind of from a you know detaching from what Apple's position is the the case where I see a challenge is in this the scenario I outlined of like the random horoscope app that says hey we'll give you better horoscopes if you use a credit card versus using in-app payment um and then sells your credit card number you know there is a benefit to the user that you've got this secure sealed payment system where the app developer doesn't get your your card and i think the analysis one could do is actually i think most app developers will carry on using in-app payment because it's probably got higher conversion i mean it will certainly have higher conversion um and that will be worth the 30 percent as opposed to trying to get people to type a credit card in and trying to get people to trust you so my suspicion is, you know, in a sense, there will be a small number of developers like Spotify, Amazon, Kindle, um, three or four others that will do this. And most people will carry on using in-app payment. Because uh, I, I would like to ask, I would like to ask Ricky, uh, we, we, we witnessed already uh, in this exchange between, between uh, uh, Benedict and, and Tim um, that, that there would be 
potentially different readings of what is expected or what is required, mandated from the gatekeepers to, to do or refrain from doing. And we uh, obviously in academic circles were inspired by the provision of uh, Article 13. You also um, were among those who were uh, quite optimistic about the, 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 the mechanics of anti-circumvention provision. Do you think this could be a, a mechanism to uh, try to enable the Commission with the, the mission, probably competences, to be more proactive and somehow pursue its own vision, its own narrative, even being aware of the coexistence of equally plausible or not as, maybe not as plausible, but still quite meaningful counter narratives, so to say. Right. So I think that's actually something that also came up a lot, a lot at the DMA stakeholder workshop, Article 13 of the DMA. And it also relates to something that Ben said earlier, this friction that can be introduced. So you allow as an app store, you allow what's legally required, but you make it actually impossible to make this workable um, for app developers under the guise of privacy, security, stability, and so on. And of course- so That's not a guise, that's real. Like, please let the, please let this phone have complete, this app have total access to everything I do on my phone. Maybe that's a problem. That's not a guise. That's like a real consumer concern. I mean, sorry. Sure. That, that will be for the commission to decide, right? I'm sure there will be cases where it's justified. I'm sure there will be many cases uh, where it's under the guise, uh, quite simply. Um, and for that, there's Article 13. So we can't just, and that's also something that Martin Snow from the ACM really emphasized in his talk uh, at the stakeholder workshop. You need to look at the details, you need to look at the nitty gritty and make sure that there's no, that while app stores, they comply on the face of the provision, actually they're introducing friction somewhere else. And that's not what the DMA is there for. And so the commission will have the important role of ensuring that this is not the case. And for that, they have article 13. So there can't be any circumvention of those provisions. Um, and if you look at article 13, actually it emphasizes that this is also not through behavioral techniques, also not through interface design and so on. So I think this is quite far reaching. And as we already see that when we discuss implementation that the gatekeepers come up with a certain narrative, Article 13 will have to, will have to come into play quite a lot, um, it would look like. And another thing that Ben mentioned is, is user trust. Now, of course, I agree, user trust is important, um, but it's not just two companies, two gatekeepers that we as users can trust, right? So trust, you have to earn it, um, but there are already alternative payment systems that we trust when we buy things online. Um, we might as well trust them when they handle payments for certain app subscriptions and so on. So I think this is something that can be shown and that that will that will be possible. Um, so yeah, anti-circumvention will be very important in the implementation. So yeah. there's a great I mean, example. I, I think could, I was I, say, it's a great example sorry, of friction is the cookie well, a cookie banner is friction introduced by regulation. So do we want more friction or do we want less friction? If you want less friction, we could get rid of cookie banners. So there are actually trade-offs that one has but to let's, grasp. Let's, let's, let's stick with the privacy and security thing. I, I think, you know, to say that, you know, we're all going to abandon privacy and security is very unlikely. I, I think, you know, the, the, the idea that current payment systems aren't secure is also not something that people would tend to hold with because their banking system is separate from um, the way that the, the you know the payment systems work in in-app payments. But if we just sort of look at this in proportionately, and I think what will have to happen is there's got to be a look at things in relation to the precise issues that are arising. So if you look at, for example, what's launched and I believe is running in the States, is that you have a, a, a payment uh, wallet, which is on the iPhone, that can contain a number of credit cards. Right? There's nothing insecure about doing that, that's running through Apple, Apple's system. But the near field communication chip 
is only activated for the use of the Apple card as a default. Now we know that defaults determine use. So that that's not correct. It's what the wallet. You, you, it's you the wallet. Any, any card you load into Apple Pay, you can use with NFC. Yes. Wallet. Um, but on the, the default the basis. That, the issue is they only allow their own wallet. And the wallet container right. can contain a card from anybody. Right. And then when, if you haven't specified which card to use, Apple sets the default to its own no. card, as I understand no. it. No. So you have to apply. Uh, so the Apple card is a credit card that you have to apply for. Yes. So yeah, so you don't, I don't really see what you have on. And what, what I was saying is that you've got, let's say you've got five cards in the Apple wallet mm. and the NFC chip is there and you can choose which card you use. That's all subject to the same security. Mm. What I was actually saying is that there's a default and this is something Apple pushed for and managed to get a standard put in place, which was released in September last year, which allows it as a browser to set the default in relation to its own card. Now, there's a lot of money potentially in I've that. Got, I've, got, I've got product, I've got an Apple card. It's not the default. Yeah, it's not okay. set as I, default. I, ben, I, you know, give me a moment, please. Um, so holding the they, product they, in my hand, it's not set as a default. It, it may not be set as a default as far as you know, right? But they well, have you spent want me the to last street and pay it it's not the default this is, this is my a... product card i mean i'm ben, sorry i'm holding the product you can use ben. it yourself so they've just taken five it's years difficult to open the wallet and see what's the default payment card it's not the apple co card it, they have just taken five years to set up the ability to set the default through the browser in a browser wallet you may not have the currently updated version that takes account of the latest standard my point was actually about security because you raised the point about security and what i was saying was look when you've set this system up it's going to be pretty secure whichever is used the security issue doesn't change the competition issue is the ability to set a default right now that is currently working through but it's all going to be as secure as any other part of the system. I don't see that as a as a particular problem. The competition issue is preferring your own card. If it hasn't happened on your phone yet, then I think it's coming to a store near I'm you. Sorry, Timothy, but this is just you just you got technology wrong, and I hate to be to be direct, but well, uh, hmm. using yeah, I've been using Apple Wallet since the beginning. I'm running the beta of the current operating system. You have always been able to change what the default card was. Y yes, of course. And you can and now. I I'm talking about, about a new standard. It doesn't standard. come with an Apple card anyway, which they haven't even launched no, yet. I wasn't anyway. suggesting it, it did, Ben. I think you're just misunderstanding me. But um, my point, right, which is not to do with your phone or the version of your phone or how you set it up. My point is about security and it being a different thing than the competition issue, right? Now, when you, because the point that was made earlier is that, you know, how is security going to be addressed and look at the cost of security. If you look at the way that the systems work, they work on underlying all of this, there's a huge margin that's being obtained. You can't say that all of the margin that is being obtained by a platform is incurred in security controls. That's yeah. it's a profit. They're already secure for their own systems. Why does it make so much difference to make some other system which is compatible, which would have to go through an API, which would have to be satisfying an API, presumably, which also has equivalent security controls for third parties. Why would it be so much more expensive? But can I I'm not for the moment, I'm not for the moment suggesting that, you know, as you did earlier, that the entire Chinese government gets access. I'm saying that this would be dealt with on a case by case, specific engineering by engineering, product by product, API by API basis. It well, just strikes me that if you integrated the Apple system with other payment systems that are equally as secure, that's an interoperability issue that can be addressed and it shouldn't be very expensive. Well, so the issue is actually very simple. 
today, any random app cannot put up a web page that says type your credit card in here to get free something. And because the Apple, Apple and Google wouldn't, Apple would not allow that. If you pass a law, as indeed as we've seen, you find we now have a law that says any app is allowed to throw up a screen that says type your credit card number in here. And so that is now, now we have gone from being as secure as in app payment, where the third party did not get your credit card. It only got a wire transfer from Apple once a week. Um, so if you buy something using in app payment, the third party, the app doesn't get your credit card number at all. They just get money from Apple. If the, whereas the alternative that, 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 that we now have is any app can just ask for your credit card. So that is now we've gone from one level of security to the level of security of the credit card system, which frankly is not very secure. Um, um, okay, if I might interrupt you. Um, it's um, actually very, uh, very simple. We've gone from the third, random third party developer not getting my credit card number to random third party credit company being allowed to ask for my credit card. And that's not necessarily good for the for a consumer in some sense. It's not been uh, a too specific discussion, uh, uh, a, a, a nuance, which is very important and it demonstrates the the, the 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 stakes, so to say. Uh, may I ask you, maybe as a matter of just, just for clarity for our viewers, uh, to to declare if there is an, any any interest, so that we we'll be aware. Vicky, do you do you, do you want to start? Maybe, do you? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, in in accordance with the Escola Declaration of Ethics, I declare no conflict of interest. Me neither. No, I have no conflict of interest here. Okay. I, I, don't, uh, I don't have a conflict you mentioned of interest. Relation. Yeah, I mean, I, I I act for the Movement for an Open Web, which is an organisation dedicated to ensuring that. Uh, the web can be used as openly and freely as possible and isn't monopolized by large gateway controllers. Uh, That's my right, client. So, yes. Um, Ricky, do you think that uh, an, another issue which was very uh, widely or intense, intensively discussed during the workshop was the, 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 the matter of choice architecture and how you design uh, messages, how often you communicate information, how you design the content of the message, how you design the visual stuff of the message. Do you think this is something which the DMA enforcers would be trying to observe closely and to, to deal with? I think they certainly should, yes, no question. Absolutely. And um, the choice architecture, obviously, if we're talking about end users, um, the gatekeepers are very good at that. And it's something that the Commission will have to look at very closely. Um, and as we have also seen from the Dutch experience with the Apple case and the dating apps, um, of course, gatekeepers try and steer users back to the to the platform. Um, so even the wording is very important, font size, font color, and so on, um, that will all come into play. So it's certainly something that competition authorities are not used to. And now, of course, we've got DG Comp and DG Connect working together on this, and we'll also see um, national authorities contributing to that. But it's something that will take some getting used to, um, how important this is and how this can really impact the proper implementation of the DMA? Well, it's an interesting question of which, I mean, I'd say that it has come up before because what you're talking about switching and things that intervene with, in, in, interpose themselves or intervene inter, 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 uh, in the switching ability for consumers. I would give you an example. Um, you may have seen this. It says sign in with Google at the top, then sign in with Apple and then um, sign in with email or don't bother. You may have seen that popping up. That that pops up in all sorts of places at the moment. When it pops up, the sign in gives the entity that you're signing in with additional data. So that is very valuable. I mean, it's valuable for advertising. It's valuable for product improvement, as I we was saying earlier. So if what you're actually looking for is information that is important to players further down the supply chain, that sign-in box, it's a kind of a three letter box thing, um, that's increasingly prevalent. And when it came up, I thought to myself, can you imagine, you know, I spent nearly 20 years working in a big company and working with lots of other big companies over the years. Can you imagine the arguments must have been put together in terms of creating such a template? So imagine you're in Google and someone's got to initiate the discussion with Apple You've got to say, okay, we're going to have a joint sign-in template. Sign-in is authentication. 
Authentication is used in all payment systems as we're talking about. This is a very, very important issue. It's not just a, a small thing. Who's going to be first on the list? Why don't we start with the alphabetical order? Why don't we have A before G? We know that preferential placement is a critically important issue in search and in any of these, uh, you know, any placement of anything on, on any phone or device is something that's heavily thought of because it adds commercial benefit. So you've now got a three slot thing, which has Google first, Apple second, and sign in with whatever third. I mean, I, it just strikes me as strange and bizarre that the authorities aren't looking at that and saying, hang on, this is a, this is, these are supposed to be two competitors, aren't they? Competing in everything they do with every straining, every sinew to attract the consumer in every possible way. And the interface is being joined up. Striking is a very, very strange thing. And, and it just amuses me to think how much time and effort must have gone in between two competitors to put that together. There's, there's a great story from the last time we did Choice Architectures, which was a browser ballot on Microsoft 20 years ago, which ironically had effectively no effect at all on, on browser market share. Um, the story I heard from someone who worked on this at Microsoft, that the EU sent them some, a template drawn in PowerPoint of what the box had to look like. And they replied saying, when we localize that for Germany, the text won't fit in the text boxes. And the EU went back to them and said, effectively, shut up do as you're told. So Microsoft did it and it deployed in Germany and the text didn't fit in the text boxes in the, in the, and the European Commission went to them and said, you're in breach of the agreement. And Microsoft said, we told you that would happen. And there is kind of a challenge here of sort of um, um, regulators designing product. And there's a kind of trade-off there of like, absolutely, you don't just let Apple and Google decide what's going to be in the text boxes. Um, but you also have to be slightly careful about um, that, you know, there are product and engineering choices um, here that you have to be conscious of. Um, and that was just kind of a kind of a classic example of what happens when the lawyer says, we're just not going to listen to them. They're wrong. And uh, of course, the, the consequence is product breaks. Um, I mean, the classic choice architecture we have at the moment um, is, as I mentioned earlier, um, cookie banners, where the irony is that the more detail regulators have pushed into cookie banners, the more the impetus is for the consumer to just say, yes, go away and stop bothering me. Um, and conversely, what's happened with um, user tracking on iOS, where Apple, um, you know, it's like the old joke, um, um, I give confidential briefings, you leak, and he's being prosecuted under the Official Secrets Act. Well, you know, Apple customizes the experience. Um, it's other people that track. So if you go to Apple settings, where Apple is describing the way that they track users, this is personalization and customization, and we don't track you. But when it's other people doing exactly the same thing, then it's tracking. Yes. Um, and so those kinds of, there's a lot of kind of nuance and detail that the yes, on the one hand, don't let Apple and Google just decide how to write the dialogue boxes. But on the other hand, when they tell you that will break in German, maybe listen to them. I think, no, I think it's a it's a very very interesting point you raise. I mean, certainly Google does the same thing, and we've got a little template which is, you know, where they call call something um, fingerprinting. That's otherwise known as uh, user agent string uh, information, and they've got lots of different um, phrases which are pejorative for third parties. But I mean, I think that the serious point in all of that is how do you design a remedy? And you know, the commissions traditional approach in antitrust is to push the uh, the person who's been accused or the declaration of breach to actually come up with the remedy. And I, I remember because I was a advisor to Microsoft at the time working on how those remedies would work. And also in terms of the remedies for the search case, which we worked on, um, it's a lot of it is down to the supplier and i think what ben raises actually fundamentally is a huge problem because you know best will in the world people who've got economics and legal background aren't great at design marketing presentation or artistic creation which goes into a lot of the the efforts of presentation and marketing materials and and how they look so i think it really is a a major problem and understanding how they're designed to then nudge people to make decisions um, is something that's often not terribly well understood. But it can be 
assessed. I mean, in the in the search case, we showed that Google's first attempt at its non-discriminatory uh, new system, when you actually put it in front of users, we used eye tracking. Um, it showed that it made absolutely no difference to user behavior. They didn't click on any of the uh, the changes that Google had put forward, and that actually originated that that stopped the uh, the proposal from going any further. And they came, they eventually come up with a better solution. I'm not sure it works terribly well though. If you look at the search remedy, if you look at the browser choice screen, I'd say it worked for a little while, but it only had a five year time limit on it. So you know, it's disappeared into history and hasn't made much difference, I would agree. Um, so we're looking for enduring remedies. We're looking for something that's robust and that works. And we're trying to avoid the regulator designing things. I think that's about as far as we can go. But I think this is going to be a very, very difficult area because so many of the cards are held by the platform. And probably as we're approaching the, the, the end of the hour, Probably my last question, uh, more general, uh, about the compliance and effectiveness of the DMA. What do you, what, what what is your gut feeling? Do you think in in a couple of years' time we would we would say that it's it's a relatively effective instrument, and it delivers at least uh, a, a portion of what uh, it is expected to to deliver, or uh, you are more skeptical or even more optimistic? Probably, Vicky, what do you think? Right, so of course that's the you know thousand dollar question, um, or yeah, thousand billion. So effectiveness of the DMA will depend on two main things, as I see it. First of all, how well the commission manages to enforce this new instrument. And as we've discussed today, I mean there are lots of challenges, lots of interpretation questions, and so on. Um, and they need to look at uh, the detail rather than on the face compliance. But the other part, of course, is the gatekeepers. And some gatekeepers have indicated in, in conversations um, that they would be really looking to be compliant and be in full compliance with the DMA. Now, of course, we can't just take your word for it. The commission will have to carefully assess that they are, but the hope would be that they want to be, um, as they have suggested. And that will then allow the DMA to be effective. And otherwise, it will be a matter for the courts. And as we know from lots and lots of antitrust cases, that will take a while and also mean that we won't see the speed of implementation that we would like to see. Thank you. Benedict, what is your view? What does your crystal ball tell you? Well, so, you know, most of what I do is I write about what's happening in technology for mostly an audience the people in technology and what I find and what I find from people at like the New York Times that I know or the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times is like anything anytime you write about regulation you get about half the engagement or less or quarter no one cares like most people don't care and an observation that I would make two observations about that one of them is like most people in tech actually don't work on anything that's addressed by the DMA like most people don't work on an app store or an ad business or that most people are actually not affected by anything in the DMA or the DSA or, DSA or even GDPR. Um, so most people don't care. But secondly, um, I wonder how many of these of this will lead to significant changes in how much of consumer tech. I don't think most of it actually is designed to kind of reshape the entire landscape. It's designed to correct certain problems. But for me, I mean, as I sort of alluded to earlier, I wonder how many game developers will even take, will even implement their own credit card payment form, as opposed to just using in-app payment, because in-app payment is one click, it's frictionless, it's already set up, it's trusted, users are used to using it. I wonder how many people other than Spotify and Kindle um, this will really change things for. And I think, you know, that may not necessarily be a bad thing. It's not like an objective of this to fundamentally change the entire structure of the industry. But I think there's like you could kind of pick like three or four relatively narrow things where this might be very consequential, like Spotify, like maybe web browsers. But I'm you know, all, all due respect, I'm kind of doubtful about how many users are really going to go and install a third party web browser, even if it is allowed to use a different rendering engine. I don't actually, I think a lot of these are sort of quite narrow concerns for relatively small parts of the consumer technology and most of the industry, um, the underlying problems that these are designed to solve don't really affect them. And so um, won't actually be changed that much. 
Yeah. Or well, maybe I, I don't know whether I'm optimistic or more pessimistic. I, look, my, my first point is that I think that remedies depend on incentives. So when we looked at in BT, because I'm one of the architects of what's called Open Reach, which is a local access vehicle in the UK that's designed to secure FRAND access to a telecoms platform, I think it's worked quite well. But that's because the underlying incentives for compliance were aligned with compliance. So my, my first observation is I'm not sure they are with the DMA. I think there's a lot of opportunity for anybody who wants to take the sort of point I made about, well, what's a requirement and how does that mean? You know, you can argue those things for a very long time and appeal them. I think the DMA is also a bit flawed, I, rather unfortunately, because it's tried to displace due process rights, which I just can't see that working. You know, it took quite a while before we had a hearing officer in front of the European Commission, but eventually it goes to court and you end up with a hearing officer because, you know, there has to be a compliance with due process rights. And in order to speed up the system, that looks like there's been some, some um, corner cutting there, which is unfortunate. So that gives opportunities for people to, to appeal things. I think the, the, the un underlying point, though, is that I think the thing that will make all the difference probably isn't the DMA. It's the parallel actions that are being taken under current law, whether it's the big cases the DOJ is taking against Google, the case that's going on against Apple and App Store payment systems for Apple, um, you know, what the UK is doing on browsers. Those are all kind of up in the air at the moment, and they're all going to end up with remedies. In the UK, the browser remedy could be very significant. I think if you're running a multinational, you comply with the law that's the most restrictive because it's very difficult to do things on a very decentralized country by country basis. So we'll see what happens, but I'm not sure the DMA is necessarily going to be, uh, you know, make that much difference. So to that extent, I agree with Ben. Um, I think it's it's a bit woolly. It's going to take two years before they really start implementing it, and then they're going to reserve changes. It's going to be one of those slow march sort of things. So it's almost like watching a car crash in slow motion. We have a tradition uh, closing our conversation with some recommendation to students and those who just at the beginning of their profession, you uh, obviously, you know, you, you observe the evolution in, in, in from different corners or from different perspectives of, of, of law and technology. So maybe you have some, some you know, really smart and helpful advice, uh, which can be somehow taken on board. Vicky, what do you think? So I would just say two things, read widely and be tech savvy. That should, that should get you started. I think seeing how many times this has happened before is always interesting. I mean, I mentioned Microsoft um, and the web browser. Um, someone pointed out to me a court case, I think from the 60s, about Ford bundling a car radio in a car, and is this allowed? Which he then kind of picked up and used as a case study to talk about what Apple and Google are allowed to include in their platform. And it's always just kind of useful to understand a question in any context by thinking like, how many times has the same kind of question come up before? What does that look like? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, maybe it's a, a point of, because I enjoyed it so much, I would say go and work for a tech company for a while because um, you can understand you know how these things work rather better when you've looked at how you build them victoria robertson uh, benedict evans uh, tim cohen thank you very much for discussing your views with with our audience thank you thanks very thank much. you